All right, we have been studying in this uh, great uh, book, The Acts of the Apostles, um, the historical book of the New Testament. We are taking our time working through it carefully because it's a historical textbook. It is not a doctrinal epistle like the books of Romans and Galatians and Ephesians. And so a lot of confusion can come if you read through the Acts of the Apostles and don't understand when God is working with the Jews, like in chapters 1 through 7, trying to offer the nation to them, and when He changes and then begins working with the Gentiles and establishing predominantly a Gentile church because the Jews would not have Jesus as their king. So, you know, we're taking our time going through this. We have seen the Holy Ghost came in chapter 2. And the first work that the Holy Ghost did was begin to speak through these Christians, these apostles, in tongues which were earthly languages speaking Scripture. Because the desire now was God was going to invert the entire witness of Himself. The Old Testament had always been a singular witness in one land, at one temple, in one language. And now God's going to multiply and have a multiple witness in many lands, to the ends of the earth, in many languages. And so God is doing His first change to show a major testamental change going on. And He had to mark it with a wonder of speaking in tongues. And the first thing they spoke was Scripture. So I don't know if you're a person that follows tongues or anything like that. But, but if you are, and of course we know rightly dividing, God is not using that gift now in Gentiles. It was always to unbelieving Jews, to convince unbelieving Jews. If He gave it to a believing Jew, it was to convince an unbelieving Jew. And we saw that in our studies. So uh, the confusion nowadays with tongues. But if you were to speak in tongues, and hopefully you're not, but if you do, I certainly hope you're speaking Scripture. Mm-hmm. And if you're not speaking Scripture, you're not helping anybody. Mm-hmm. Scripture. That's what the Holy Ghost did, chapter 2. Chapter 3, the Holy Ghost now begins to work in another manner as He works through these apostles to give them the power to heal in the name of Jesus Christ. Again, this is a gospel of the kingdom sign and wonder. This is not a gospel of grace work that we can do now. You and I can't go out and heal anybody in the name of Jesus Christ physically. We can heal their soul by giving them Jesus Christ, and if they will receive Jesus Christ as their Savior, they will have the most important healing they can get, which is a spiritual healing, a healing of the soul. And then when Jesus comes back, He'll heal their body and give them a brand new 33-year-old body that will last forever. So we understand that too. Now we come to the fourth chapter. Peter has preached one sermon in chapter 2 in the morning, preached a second sermon in chapter 3 in the afternoon, and now that he's finishing his sermon, ending in 3 verse 26, saying, unto you first, unto you Jewish people, God, having raised up His Son Jesus, sent Him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. And again, he's at the temple and he's offering the Jewish nation an opportunity to repent as a nation and receive Jesus as king. Now, I'm sure that he would like to give an invitation like he did in the last chapter. But, verse 1 in chapter 4 says, And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. They're going to be interrupted. In verse 1 through 4, we're going to see an interruption. They're going to interrupt the preaching of the gospel. Who's going to interrupt the preaching of the gospel? The priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees. Religious people. Who interrupts the preaching of the gospel? Religious people. Who doesn't like the gospel? Religious people. I was reading um, in a commentary written about 30 years ago by Dr. J. Vernon McGee. And uh, he was a pastor in Los Angeles uh, starting in the 1940s and 50s and 60s a while back. And he said they set up their church. It was called the Church, I believe, of the Open Door mm-hmm. was the name of the church in, in uh, central Los Angeles. And he said, and there were drunkards, and there were pornographers, and there were gamblers, and there was the mob and all that. He said, they never gave me any trouble preaching the gospel. The people that fought me preaching the gospel were the religious people. The mainline denominational religions, Protestant mainline religions, like the Sadducees, like, uh, he said, the, some of the Catholics, like the priests. The lost religious people were the ones that fought me all the time. They tried to get my station taken off the air. They tried all kinds of city injunctions. He said, those were the ones that gave me the problem. Times haven't changed. 
folks. It's the religious people that fight with Jesus Christ. Have you ever tried to witness to someone? Okay. In, if you are, the folks that are going to fight with you are going to be religious people. Religious people will fight with you. They'll argue with you. They'll try and stop you from witnessing. I've had that happen a number of times. When we take our young men on door-to-door ministries, it's interesting. We're going door-to-door. The express purpose is to give the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone at their door. We'll be doing this when we move to the new neighborhood. And as we work up and down the neighborhood, bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ from door-to-door, you will find the ones that will fight with us, as I found in the past, are going to be the religious people. The religious people, what they used to do with our, and I didn't know this when I was first going door to door. One of the ways they'll do it is the devil knows you've only got a couple hours. He knows you're only going to work maybe two, three hours going door to door, and then you're going to wind it up. And so what he does, he gets one of his religious friends to uh, sword fight with you with the Bible for a long time. And so all of a sudden you find yourself for one or two hours on the doorstep at a porch, maybe with a JW or a Mormon, going back and forth doing sword drills, and a whole bunch of people never heard the gospel that day. Because they're too busy tying you up and fighting with you. And you learn after a while, after a few minutes, thank you very much. I've got to move on. Thank you very much. And go to the next door. The religious people are going to be the ones that fight with you. Here it is. They're going to interrupt right here. They come upon Peter and the apostles. Verse 2. They are grieved. They're being grieved that they taught the people. Boy, I thought that's what the world wants is education. I thought they want people to be educated and enlightened. Why would you be grieved that someone is teaching? You should be thrilled. Aren't we? Don't you love the education you get here? Don't you? I love it. I love when we get together and we study the Bible. They're grieved that the people are being taught, and also grieved that they're preaching through Jesus Christ the resurrection from the dead. Now, the resurrection of the dead people was something that had been promised to the nation Israel. You would think they would be happy that this is being taught. Go back to uh, Daniel chapter 12. Let's take a look at some of the Old Testament promises of the resurrection. Daniel chapter 12. Verses 1 through 4, we're going to see interruption of the preaching. Daniel chapter 12, this is a great prophetic book in the Old Testament. This might be the equivalent of the revelation of the Old Testament, where where God reveals what He's going to do with the nation. And He says this in the 12th chapter about the nation, verse 1. At that time, during the time of tribulation, shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, Daniel, thy people, Jews, you're of the tribe of Judah. And there shall be a time of trouble, that's the tribulation, Jacob's trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Verse 2, here it is. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt. There's the promise of people awaking from the dead and being resurrected. And that was the great hope of the Jewish people. Abraham had always hoped that he would inherit the land. God had told him he would inherit the land. He was looking for the city whose builder and maker is God, and he never got that city, and he died with that hope in him, hoping that the day would come when he would be resurrected and live in that land with his God being his Savior there in that land. So this is what they look forward to. Go to the next book, Hosea chapter 6, very next book after Daniel. Hosea chapter 6. Hosea is given a prophecy of the time when the nation would come back to the Lord and he sees some things. And again, we've studied this before. I just reiterate for you when it comes to prophecy. When God writes prophecy in the Scripture, remember where he's sitting. He's sitting on his throne in eternity. So he looks and he sees the whole picture and he might just mention something here and mention something here and they're 2,000 years apart and just put them together very quickly. God's viewing from a great distance and the things seem close to Him. When we're down here walking through the woods and the wilderness of time, that's a long ways apart. He just put those in the same sentence 2,000 years apart. He does that often. So we learn how God writes prophecy. We've seen Jesus teach us this in Luke chapter 4. But here we are in Hosea chapter 6. And it says in verse 1, Come, let us return unto the Lord. For He hath torn, He will heal us. He hath smitten, He will bind us up. After two days, 
He will revive us, and in the third day He will raise us up, and we shall live in His sight. There's the resurrection of being raised up. A day unto the Lord's a thousand years. They knew that from Moses. Psalm 90. A day in God's sight is as yesterday. A thousand years are as one day in God's sight. So, they understood this is, there's going to be a resurrection one day. They were excited about the thought of the resurrection. And here, in this verse, who's going to do the raising up? Look at verse 1. The Lord. The Lord is responsible for the resurrection. The Sadducees are grieved because they're teaching the resurrection in the name of Jesus. What are you teaching those people? Well, we're teaching them Jesus is the Lord. Oh, we can't have that man to be our ruler. We don't want him to be our Lord. There's the argument. The Scriptures made it clear resurrection would be by the Lord. They're preaching Jesus is doing the resurrecting. Wait a second, then A equals B. Wait a second, this is... You're saying Jesus is the Lord. They were grieved at this teaching. You know that's grieved at today? It's okay if you talk about Jesus the man from Nazareth. It's okay if you talk about Jesus the prophet. It's okay if you talk about Jesus the good teacher. But what if you say Jesus is God? Jesus is the Lord. You want to try that sometime? I mean, seriously. Talk to people about that. Did you ever tell them Jesus is the Lord? He's God. He's God in the flesh. People get grieved when they hear that. The implications are profound. Implications are life-changing. Implications are world-changing, which we're going to find out. They're grieved at this kind of teaching. One other thing, turn to uh, John chapter 11. Gospel of John chapter 11. This was, this was a well-known teaching, the resurrection. But... People don't like it when we start getting specific about it and put it to reality and explain this resurrection is through Jesus Christ. I tell you another, let me tell you another well-known teaching today that I'm sure your ears are familiar with. Even the lost friends you have are familiar with this. The second coming of Christ. You know, a lot of people say, they'll use it in a metaphorical sense. Yeah, that's going to happen when the, when the Lord comes back. That will happen at the second coming of Christ. Lost people know about the second coming of Christ. To them, it's like a hyperbolic, metaphorical, spiritual teaching that has no reality. You and I believe it has a lot of reality. You ever bring it right down where the shoe uh, leather meets the road and talk to people about the second coming of Christ? I do that. Boy, they get grieved and unnerved over that. You mean he's really coming back? Oh, yeah, he's really coming back. Well, you know, nobody knows. Oh, he's coming back soon. Read the Bible. Two days from his death, burial, and resurrection. Not from his birth from his death, burial, and resurrection. Two days. Yeah, coming close on it. 2033, somewhere around then. Yeah, he's coming back. You're living in the generation that's going to see it happen. I talk to people about that. Man, and they get grieved and unnerved. They like it to be some, just, it's just a saying. It's not, no, it's really going to happen. He's coming back to take over this mess. Second coming of Christ. Now here, the resurrection though to the a uh, Jew and the second coming of Christ to the Christian, quote unquote Christian, unnerves these folks. Jesus uh, was uh, had a man friend of his die by the name of Lazarus, and um, Jesus said to Lazarus' sister Martha in verse twenty three, John eleven twenty three. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. <laughs> And Martha saith unto him, Well, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. In the resurrection at the last day. Now, I want to show you. They were grieved that preaching the resurrection through Jesus. Because you're saying here that Jesus equals the Lord. You're saying here in the book of Acts, chapter 3, that the Lord of Hosea, chapter 6, this is how the resurrection is coming. They're upset about that, but they're upset about one other thing. If you were to, um, go to go back to Acts. Martha knew about the resurrection. Everybody knew about the resurrection, but watch carefully what he says, what they're grieved at in Acts chapter 4, verse 2. They're grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection, no, not of the dead, the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection from the dead. That's a difference. There's a difference there. I'm going to show you from the Scriptures. They're really upset about that, and I'm going to show you why that is. They're preaching the resurrection 
from the dead. That really grieved him. And you want to contrast that with the resurrection of the dead. When Martha said, I know that he'll rise again, she said, when? In the last day. I know there will be a resurrection of the dead in the last day. I know, she says, there's going to be something called a general resurrection of the dead in the last day. Because in the last day, what's going to happen, if I understand this properly, Martha says, as someone who's been listening to the Sadducees and the Pharisees, as someone who's been listening to my teachers, there's going to be a day coming when we'll all get to stand before God and we'll be judged on our works, you see, at that resurrection. And we'll all get to walk in there and those who've done more good deeds than bad deeds get to enter the gates of heaven. And those that did more bad deeds than good deeds, well, they're just going to have to go off into hell into judgment. There's going to be a general resurrection of the dead. But that's not what Peter's preaching. He's preaching a resurrection from the dead. He's preaching a difference. See, the general resurrection of the dead is the thought that men will get to stand by their own righteousness. And and Jesus didn't teach their own righteousness. Go to the next book after Acts, Romans chapter 3. And Paul clarifies this, and I'm going to show you that Jesus mentioned this too. Jesus taught this doctrine. Peter's preaching this doctrine. Paul will teach this doctrine. This is no new doctrine that I'm going to show you in the Scriptures. And therefore, if somebody tells you this was started in the 1800s, <laughs> they're kidding you because I'm showing you from the Scriptures this doctrine you're going to learn today, the resurrection from the dead, has been around from the time of Jesus. He taught it in Mark chapter 9. Here is the problem with the resurrection of the dead and the general resurrection that's taught out there that people are going to stand of their own works. They're counting on making it by their own works. But Jesus is saying there's going to be a resurrection from the dead. I'll show you Mark chapter 9. This resurrection is based on Romans 3 verse 21. It's not on men's righteousness, but it's Romans 3.21. But... Here, God's going to throw a butt at you. You know how we always, we're always like, Billy goes with him, but, 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 you know, but you want me to do that, Lord, but you want... He says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Not the righteousness of men. It's, it's witnessed by the law and the prophets. It's the righteousness of God, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all. When he died, he paid for the sins of all. And upon, it rests upon all them that believe. Although it's offered to all, it doesn't rest upon all. It only rests upon believers. This is the righteousness. Verse 28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. This general resurrection of the dead, if you think you're going to get there by the deeds of the law, you're not going to make it. You're going to have to have the resurrection from the dead according to the righteousness of God. Go to Romans chapter 10. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, the temple captains, they were upset. And Paul says, Romans 10.1, Brethren, my heart's desire, prayer to God for Israel, those Sadducees, those Pharisees, those temple guard, Martha, all those people that have been hearing that Israeli doctrine is that they might be saved. I bear them record. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, are going about to establish their own righteousness. They're hoping to make it at a general resurrection based on their own righteousness by deeds of the law. (laughs) That's not the resurrection you want to go at. Go back to Mark 9. Let me show you what Jesus... I'll show you these things. We'll put them together. Show you the difference. You need the resurrection from the dead. Folks, you don't want to be at the resurrection of the dead. And if you are there, you you better be there in a new body. Mark chapter 9. After the transfiguration, which happens in the first eight verses, verse 9, as they came down from the mountain, he, that's Jesus, verse 8, charged them, those are the people up there, Peter, James, and John, charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen until the Son of Man were risen from the dead. There's going to be a rising from the dead. There's going to be a resurrection that's going to precede this big general resurrection over here. There's going to be a rising that's going to happen ahead of this one over here. 
And that's the one Jesus is the first fruits of. And that's the one you and I want to be a part of. That's the blessed and holy first resurrection. What he was teaching, what Jesus was showing them, they didn't quite get it. What Peter was preaching, some of the Sadducees were starting to get it. What Paul teaches clearly in First and Second Thessalonians, and I hope Christians get it, is that there's going to be a rapture ahead of a resurrection. And the resurrection from the dead is a rapture event. And Jesus resurrected from the dead in a glorified body, ascended up into heaven. That's a picture of a rapture happening way ahead of this thing over here. Again, let me show you some more verses. Go to John chapter 5. You know, what, what the Lord does with His Scripture, Scripture is like seed. It's like seed. And, and you know, seed is something that must be planted and then must be watered and then it starts to unfold and blossom its truth. And so you've got to chew on it for a while and water it and meditate it and it opens up. This is a spiritual book. And so God speaks in little seed. I mean, just think about it. Wouldn't studying Acts, right? You're going to find out that Peter preached for two hours in the morning and preached about an hour and a half in the afternoon. And if you were to read through both those sermons, Acts 2 and 3, it would take you less than five minutes. So what did, the, what did God give you in the Scriptures? He gave you the seed. Enough to bring forth truth if you meditate on it and let His Spirit open it up to you. What if you don't let His Spirit open up? It's nothing to you. It's like chaff to you, to the unsaved mind. The natural man cannot receive these things. Jesus, John chapter 5, he's teaching here in John chapter 5. They're angry with Jesus. The religious people are very angry because he's just performed a very important miracle. And they were grieved and angered with him because he had done this. Uh, verse uh, 16. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. He had healed a man on the Sabbath day. And they wanted to persecute him. Religious people angry at Jesus. So then he goes on to talk to them for a while and explain some things. And he says to them in this particular fifth chapter, picking it up in, let's say, verse 29, And shall come forth. Now, verse 28. Marvel not at this. For the hour is coming at which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. That's the Son of Man, verse 27. And shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life... <laughs> And they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. The general resurrection is the resurrection of damnation. The resurrection from the dead is the resurrection unto life. Resurrection of life. And they're preaching, there's a righteousness... Sadducees, Pharisees, temple goers, feast worshipers, that isn't going to make it for you. You need the righteousness of God and you need the resurrection from the dead and that only comes through Jesus Christ. That doesn't come through your works. Well, they're grieved at that. And you say you're trying to say if you become born again that you're going to be okay and you're going to make it at the judgment. Yeah. I just don't believe that. Sadducees are no different than people today. You're born again. You're getting the resurrection of life. You're going to be resurrected from the dead. Go to Revelation chapter 20. There's two resurrections. They're separated by a great distance in time. Jesus was the first fruits of that first resurrection. Jesus was resurrected, listen to the words carefully, from the dead. He wasn't dead. Oh, yes, he was. Okay. I'll grant you this. His soul and his spirit were separated from his body. But the wages of sin is death. And he wasn't a sinner. And he had no sin on his soul. So yes, there was a separation. And yes, he was physically dead, but he was spiritually alive unto God. So when he wandered around dropping our sins off down there in the heart of the earth, like we've studied in our series before, when he dropped those sins off and he went in to the everlasting gates of hell and broke in to drop the sins off and the devil saw him coming in, there was a bunch of dead sinners dead in their trespasses and sins around there and there was one live guy walking in, dropping off some sins, taking the keys from the devil and splitting. And his resurrection was from the dead. He wasn't dead. He was a living guy walking amongst dead people down there. And, and if you got saved, that's the condition you're in. You now have a dying, corrupting body, but on the inside, your soul is wrapped in a Holy Spirit and you have eternal life. 
<laughs> you can be resurrected from the dead because you're not dying, Christian. The most you're going to face is a separation of your soul and your body. Big whiff. <sighs> Big deal. What, are you going to scare me with heaven? <laughs> That's where you go when you're absent from the body. Is present with the Lord. The difference is found in this chapter, Revelation chapter 20. Verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. And judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived. Yeah, their body was dead, but they're living. And they reigned with Christ a thousand years. And the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years are finished. But these folks, this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. That's the resurrection of life. They're preaching Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. And that only comes through Jesus Christ. You want, you want to go into general resurrection and damnation? That's later in the chapter. A thousand years later, you can see what happens. Verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. There was no place found for them, and I saw, watch it, the dead. These folks are really dead. This is the resurrection of the dead. Small and great, stand before God. The books were open. Another book was open. And the book of life. And here it is again. The dead were judged out of those things. This is the resurrection of the dead. This is the resurrection of the damnation. Oh, the dead were judged. And, and they were judged, every man according to their works. You want to stand on your own works? Come on up at this resurrection of the dead. God will let you do it. You've got a free will. You want to do it? You can do it. You can be grieved like a Sadducee. Or you can receive Jesus and have resurrection from the dead. Which, by the way, when you think of it technically, it happens when you get born again. So you're walking around in a live body with a dead spirit inside you. When you get born again, all of a sudden you're quickened and you're alive in Christ. And you're resurrected right there from that dead spirit. Now you've got a live soul and spirit with everlasting life in it. And a dying body. And your body's going to go down and your spirit's going to go up real fast. Faster than a bullet shot in the air. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, bang. And you're present with your Lord. And so he's teaching the resurrection from the dead and they don't like that teaching. And folks, that's the truth. That's biblical truth. And they don't like that teaching today. So you know what we do? We tell them anyways. So let's go back to Acts. We're going to keep telling them. Acts chapter 4. Verse 2. They were grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. What do you think? We're better than, you're better than we are? Well, no. No. I get this all the time. I think Jesus is better than anyone that ever lived. And Jesus is good. And I think a sinner like me deserves to go to hell. But I've placed my faith in Jesus. And now he's, he's given me eternal life. And it lasts forever. And I couldn't go to hell if I wanted to now. Because he's faithful. And if I make a lot of mistakes and get a bad report card, he'll take care of that during the millennium. Christian, you want to get a bad report card after you're saved? You can get a bad report card after you're saved. You can't lose your salvation. You're going to lose a lot of rewards in the millennial kingdom. If you won't serve now, you will serve for a thousand years in the millennial kingdom. We've done the studies before. But you're saved. You're saved. And after the millennial kingdom's over, then we're all equal in heaven. But you'll get some time to pay the Lord back if you won't serve Him now. Verse 3. So they're grieved. And they laid their hands on, on them. And they put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. So it was getting late, it's around 6 o'clock. Eh, put them in prison. So we get an interruption and an incarceration. And you know what? Peter never got an opportunity to give an invitation to anybody. To invite them to receive Jesus like he did in the last chapter. But look what happens, verse 4. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed. And the number of men was about 5,000. People get saved, even if you don't give an invitation, the important thing is hearing the Word. Amen. It's the Word of God. Amen. If you'll put out the Word of God, the Holy Ghost will do the inviting and He'll do the saving. Amen. 
Our job is to faithfully sow the word. God's job is to give the increase. Yes, he can use us if we give an invitation, and he can get by us if we don't give an invitation. God makes the transaction. He's the only licensed obstetrician in the new birth. Step aside. It's his turn to do the new birth. Just got to help him by giving the word out. And so many were saved. 5,000. 5,000. Boy, that's a meeting. That's a meeting. (laughs) Now, in the next verses, as we go on verses uh, 5 through 22, now we're going to have an interrogation. Now it's time to get these guys together. Let's call a big council and have an interrogation here. We've interrupted them. It didn't work. 5,000 people still got saved. Look, if you're faithful in giving out the word and somebody interrupts you in the midst of you're giving out the word to someone, you go away from that thing, oh, doggone it, I didn't get to give it all out. I never got to tell them the whole Romans road. I didn't get to invite them. You know, people still get saved. Because if, if God, who looks on the heart, sees a tender heart that wants to know Jesus, he'll get that one saved. You may not find out about it until you get to heaven. And then someone will say, you know, it was that witness you gave to me. And God will say, look, he'll put you together up there. God is faithful. So the Holy Ghost did his work. Now they're going to have an interrogation. Five, three, I don't know what it is. Twenty-two, is it? Twenty-two, yeah, interrogation. Got the hot lights on there. Give them the third degree. Verse 5, And it came to pass on the morrow that the rulers, the elders, the scribes, Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. Nepotism in religion? You've got to be kidding me. Surely you're joking. I guess nothing's new. Did you see this? Annas, the high priest, I guess he was, they were related, it says in the book of John. Caiaphas, John and Alexander, as many were of the kindred of the high priest. It was a good paying job. It was like a civil appointed job. The money was flowing in the coffers. People would come by at the temple, throw that money in the box, and guess who got to collect it and distribute it? And you know, some of my relatives need to be in on this. Isn't it sad? You know what? If someone wants to be involved in serving the Lord, let God work on their heart. And here's nepotism going on. So so I'm I'm not surprised. The same thing goes on today. Verse 7. Everyone was gathered together in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. Verse 7. And when they had set them, the apostles, in the midst, they asked them, By what power or by what name have you done this? In other words, if you're going to come here preaching, you have a license to preach? Have you, have you graduated from an accredited seminary? Are you an ordained ministry? An ordained minister? Do you honestly think you can come out here preaching about Jesus Christ? Are you a Christian? Do you know Jesus Christ? Are you a witness? A witness tells what he knows. Do you know you've been saved? You can go out anywhere. You don't need to be ordained. You're ordained of God. You don't need a license from the state. You have a license from the God of the universe. That's the power and authority. They're going to hear this in a minute. But they're looking for civil power, civil authority. You know, when this nation was founding, I was reading a book going way back into the 1600s and 1700s before they chartered the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. They had a commonwealth of various little, uh, what were they called? Something with a C. The name just flew out of my head. Colonies. Colonies. Thank you, brother. (laughs) They weren't states yet. They were colonies. And the various colonies were set up by various religious groups. And they started giving out licenses to preach. So up in Massachusetts, Commonwealth of Massachusetts would give out licenses to ordained ministers from, I can't remember if it was Anglican or Episcopal that ran that one up there. And then there was another one. And uh, I was reading about preachers, mostly were Baptist preachers, who believed in the Baptist doctrine in that the only people that should be baptized are believers that confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They don't believe in infant baptism and they don't even believe baptism is necessary for salvation. Isn't that, isn't that funny? The only religious group that doesn't believe baptism is necessary for salvation are Baptists. <laughs> isn't that curious? Because they're like John the Baptist. They're just a voice in the wilderness preaching Jesus Christ. And all you need to do is to receive Jesus Christ. They understand that. But if you have received Jesus Christ, they will advise, why don't you get baptized as an adult? And Baptist preachers were being arrested in the colonies and thrown in jail for preaching without a license. 
And people came forward and started to defend them, lawyers like Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson. Mm -hmm. And that's when they charted the Constitution and said, look, people have a freedom to preach. We're going to have a First Amendment here. Mm -hmm. We're not going to incarcerate people. Mm -hmm. But the folks back then, if it weren't for some lawyers that wanted to defend them, like Thomas Jefferson and Patrick Henry, we probably would have had a state just like uh, the Pharisees. By what authority do you have a right to preach? That was what was going on. Mm -hmm. That's the tendency, by the way, folks, of all the harlot and her children. Okay, The mother of harlots, Revelation 17, is Babylon, mystery Babylon and her false religion. And she's the mother of harlots. She got plenty of children. And the mark of her harlot children are infant baptism. And those folks that believe in infant baptism will always persecute the ones that preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Back then, the mark was circumcision. It's always something done to an infant. Somehow to make an infant, part of God's kingdom. God doesn't do it that way. You must believe. You can do it as a child, but you must believe. The faith, the just shall live by faith four times in your Bible. Faith. Faith. He that cometh to God must believe that which he has written. Faith cometh by hearing. So, same old thing going on back then. By what power? What authority? Verse 8. Then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, there's the key. The Acts of the Apostles, they're going to do all of their acts upon the filling of the Holy Ghost. You're going to see this phrase over and over. Why? They're getting daily filled with the Holy Ghost. Psalm 23, one of our favorite psalms. The Lord is my shepherd. Do you know one of the verses in there? It says, my cup runneth over. Now, if the Lord is your shepherd, your cup ought to run over. If your cup isn't running over, you probably are not too close to your shepherd because his job is to pour into your cup such an abundance that it runneth over. Why? He wants to pour in enough for you and for some people around you so that they can come and catch what's falling out of your cup and get a little drink of the water of life freely. That's what the shepherd wants to do. If you're a Christian and your cup isn't running over, you're not getting filled. Why are you not getting filled? You're not close to your shepherd. Your shepherd is called the Word of God with a capital W. He speaks through the Word of God with a little w. The devil, understanding this, in 1881 started perverting Bibles. So, you've got mostly pervert, perverted Bibles out there. You have one authentic scripture, a Holy King James Bible, and a lot of perverted counterfeits. So what happens? They're pouring out of empty Bibles. Nothing comes out. So Christians are dry and thirsty. If you're a Christian and you do have the right Bible, that's the authorized version of the Holy King James Scriptures, and you're still thirsty, then it's your fault for not spending time filling up every day. Peter spent that night in prison getting filled. And the key to doing anything for the Lord is by the power of His Spirit. Paul will say, I serve the Lord in my spirit, not in my flesh. And spirit links to spirit. God's spirit must link with your spirit, and the Spirit of God attends the Word of God. So he's filled with the Spirit. The filling of the Holy Spirit is something that you're supposed to do every day, Christian. You're supposed to fill up. Unlike your car, which might go a few days without filling, you need a daily filling. And if you do fill, the Lord Jesus Christ promises that your cup will run over. It will run over. It won't just fill you. You'll touch someone else that day with the water of life. So Peter's filled. He's done his job reading and praying through the night. And filled with the Holy Ghost, he said unto them. Now he's going to give a great teaching and preaching here. And again, it's going to be the work of the Holy Ghost. Go back to... Um, Luke 12. In this particular one, Jesus is explaining to them in verse 2, words are word, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. 
They'll, they'll, hypocrisy is the word that we get acting from, professional actors. What do they do? They play something that they are not. That's what an actor does. He plays a role of something he is not. What does a religious leader do? He plays a role as though he knows God. That ought to make you mad. That makes me mad. I, I get angry that there are men and women walking around pretending like they know God and they don't. They're not even saved. That is the height of hypocrisy. Walking around in a flowing black robe with a white collar and people thinking he knows God and he doesn't even know God in a personal way. That is hypocrisy. That is rotten. That is deceptive. If you're going to speak for God, you better know God. Otherwise, keep your mouth shut and get another job. And beware of people like this, Jesus says. It's hypocrisy what they do. Pretending to know God and they don't know God. Speaking for God. Verse 2, thank goodness there's a day coming. There's nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. You're going to know all the wicked works that they've done in darkness. Now he goes on and he says this about these folks. Verse 11, when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto the magistrates and unto the powers, take ye no thought of what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in that same hour what ye ought to say. They're being brought now before a council. What authority do you have to speak in the name of God? And Christian, if you're ever brought before something like that, you are being persecuted. And at that time, you don't have to think about ahead of time, how am I going to answer this? If you're walking close with your Savior, He will put in your mouth the words to say. He will bring the Scriptures to remembrance. He knows exactly what those folks need to hear to prick their hearts. And the Holy Ghost now is going to speak through Peter. Go back to where you were in the book of Acts. They're bringing these folks before them for one reason and one reason only. Because they were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me just stop for one minute before I go on and tell you. That is persecution. Persecution. And persecution is something that happens to Christians, according to the Bible. Punishment is different. and I want to show you the difference. Go to... Um, go to... First Peter, because Peter won't be persecuted here. He'll write about it. Go to First Peter, chapter two. What's happening to these men is they're being brought before a council and being interrogated for preaching about Jesus Christ. That's persecution. Peter will show the difference between punishment and persecution. He says in chapter two, verse thirteen. Submit yourselves unto every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors, as to them that are sent by him, by God, for the punishment of evil doers. So, so punishment is what good people do to us when we do, do something evil. That's punishment. If you do something evil as a Christian... God wants you to be punished and you ought to be punished and you ought to understand you deserve the punishment that you're getting. That's punishment. If, if you're caught stealing at work, and I hope you don't ever get caught stealing at work as a Christian, but if you're caught, you deserve to be punished and God wants you to be punished. Punishment is what good people do to us for when we do something evil. But he goes down here and goes a little bit further and he says, verse 18, servants... Be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. This is thankworthy. Watch. For if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. That's persecution. Persecution is what bad people do to you when you've done something good. That's persecution. Punishment is what good people do to you when you've done something bad. Persecution is what bad people do to you when you've done something good. And what's the best and the goodest thing, pardon the colloquialism there, that you can possibly do? That's tell someone about Jesus Christ yeah. and how to get eternal life. See, he says in the next verse, verse 19, or, or verse 20, What glory is it if, if when you be buffeted for your faults, you take it patiently? You're being punished. You did something wrong. That's not a big deal. You should get punished. Look, next part of the verse. But if when you do well, you preach the gospel and suffer for it, 
and you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even here unto were ye called. Christian. Christian. God has called you and me to tell people about His Son. Say, but when I go out and do that, they get angry at me. They get mad at me. They want to shut me up. They don't. Do it anyways. I'm going to be persecuted. That's all right. You were called unto persecution. You were, look at Jesus, 21. For here unto ye were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in His steps. Persecution for preaching the gospel is what God expects to happen. What we're seeing here in chapter 4 is splayed out there as a portrait for us to see how it is going to come. You're not going to avoid it. Say, well, I'll avoid it. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Then you may not be persecuted by evil people, but one day you're going to meet a good person named Jesus who's going to punish you for being a bad boy and committing a sin of omission and not preaching his gospel. But I'm saved. There's a millennial kingdom when he gets to work things out and you get your report card. That's when you get punished. It's not going to cost you your salvation. You're saved. You're going to pay during the millennial kingdom. That's the way it works. You can serve him now or serve him later. Serve him now. It's only two decades. Take a thousand years off. That makes sense to me. Serve him for 20, get a thousand off. I'm not serving him for 20. Fine, then work for a thousand. Do the math. We're called on to this. Second Timothy chapter three. Back up a few books. Paul is telling a young preacher boy, Timothy, about what his life has been like and also impressing upon him the most important thing that he needs to do is preach the word. And be instant. In season, out of season. Just preach that word. Chapter, well, you're in chapter 3, chapter 4. He tells them to do that. But look at chapter 3. He says, verse 10, Thou hast fully known my doctrine. It's the doctrine of Christ. My manner of life. I try to lead a good life with a conscience void of offense. My purpose, to get out the gospel. My faith, faith in Jesus Christ. Long-suffering. People didn't like it. Charity. Still giving them love. Patience persecutions and afflictions which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. But out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. For what reason? Because I'm telling them the truth. And men love darkness rather than light. Because the light reveals their deeds, that they're evil. But don't turn the lights out. Keep them on. Keep them on. So go back to where we were in Acts. I just wanted to show you, this is part of the Christian life. And that's why the portrait's being painted here. Say, boy, isn't that great? I'd like to have all that power. Well, (laughs) you you preach with power, you're going to get some persecution. That's okay, the Lord will deliver you out of it, as He's going to do with Peter here. So what power are you doing this by? Verse 8, then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost. That's the way you want to speak, filled with the Holy Ghost. You don't want to be filled with your spirit. You don't want to be filled with an unclean spirit. Don't give place to the devil, Christian. You can do that. You read bad things. You hear bad teachings. You'll find yourself giving doctrines of devils out. You want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Peter said, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, impotent means a man without power. He didn't even have the power to walk. This deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole? Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, again, Jewish, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, It's going to be the preaching of that name. Peter will not diminish from the preaching of that name. They were grieved that they taught the name of Jesus. You know what bothers the devil? When you preach the name of Jesus Christ. Talk about God. Talk about religion. Talk about the Holy Spirit. Talk about signs and wonders and tongues. Talk about anything but Jesus Christ. 
these full gospel places where they're talking about the Holy Spirit. The devil loves those places. You talk about Jesus Christ, that grieves the devil. That gets his people mad. So what do you do? Be like Peter. <laughs> be known by the name of Jesus Christ in Nazareth. We were at a restaurant one day and I said to my friend, Bible-believing Christian, I said, they hate that name of Jesus in here. I'll show you. We were waiting for a pizza to be made. I said, I'm going to go around here and watch me. Just watch this. And I had a clipboard and I went from table to table. And I said, excuse me, there was an older couple first. They were like in their 60s sitting there at this table and uh, they were eating and I was dressed nicely with a shirt and tie, looked respectable, came up to them and said, excuse me, I'm just taking a survey. Just want to ask you one question. Just one question. It's a yes or no question. Would you mind answering? Oh, yes, young man. She was real polite. I said, this is the only question I want to ask. Um, have either of you ever received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? The guy dropped his fork. The woman started to shake and they asked me to leave. No answer. I said, okay, thank you very much. I went to the next table. There was a younger couple. They were in their late 20s. They had a little kid in a high chair there they were feeding. I said, excuse me, I'm just taking a survey, a poll, and just one question I want to ask. This happened at a restaurant in Transit Road. I said, um, is it okay if I ask you a question? Just, oh, sure. Have either of you ever received the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Get him out of here. Listen, you better go away. I said, fine, fine, that's okay, buddy. The devil doesn't like when you preach that name. Be it known to all you rulers of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from, from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Now he's quoting Psalm 118. That's a big psalm to these guys. That's a, that, that was a psalm they used all the time at the feast days. And he's explaining that this is the headstone. This is the corner. This is what God's going to use to build. They understood the headstone, the cornerstone, was what they built the temple on. He's saying, you know what? It's all built on Jesus Christ. This is the head of the corner. Verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And that's what he had to say to them. Short and sweet. Why? Because Christ Jesus came into the world to seek and to save that which was lost. And we must be saved because we're naturally lost and we must be born again. These are not suggestions or recommendations. This is truth of a reality that you must apprehend or ye will die in your sins. Ye must be saved. And only by the name of Jesus Christ in Nazareth. We're running out of time. So we will continue this teaching next week. I'll show you more of the scriptural references. Any questions on what we looked at? Then let us pray and thank the Lord. Father, thank you for the perfect words in the Scriptures that paint this portrait of, of how the Holy Ghost will work and fill your children to preach about your Son, Jesus Christ. And we know, Lord, they don't like it and they may want to persecute it, but thank you, Lord, that you will deliver us out of these persecutions. Help us to keep the lights on today and to preach that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, folks can have their sins washed away and can be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.